Hey guys, we continue our march through Unit 3. We've already started off with Unit with Chapter 6. Chapter 6 a little bit of an irritating chapter in how it's put along because it takes three topics, kind of mashes them into one chapter. In my opinion, one of those topics, the media, uh, really deserves its own conversation, but nonetheless, uh, that's not how they go about their business. <laughs> Instead, uh, Chapter 7 kind of does the same thing. Chapter 7 mashes interest groups and political parties into the same conversation. We'll do both of those today. So let's go ahead and march through them, shall we? Starting with interest groups. You're seeing a bunch of interest groups around me right now. We'll talk about at least a couple of these as they come up over the course of our conversation. Now, I like to start on the ground level with every single one of these chapters. Uh, what are interest groups? Why do we have these things? Uh, why are they so important for us to learn? Well, they are very important in American politics. They're very important. Uh, first of all, here's your definition. They're organized groups of individuals sharing common objectives who actively attempt to influence policymakers. One more time, they're organized groups of individuals sharing common objectives who actively attempt to influence policymakers. Okay, now for the record, for the record, what this means in regular language is they're like-minded people. They all care about a particular subject. They're like-minded people, and they want to influence the government to favor their preferred cause. Here's some examples. You don't need to know them, but you're probably already aware of a couple of these, like the NAACP. Like This is an organization largely of people of color uh, to fight for the welfare of black citizens. If you ask the NAACP, they'll say we're, we're fighting for the right of all minorities and really for all Americans is the argument that they would make. Same thing with the AARP. Really, one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful interest group there is, that's the American Association of Retired Persons. That is a lobbying group, an interest group, that fights for the welfare of the retired, the elderly. On top of that, you have the NRA, which I'm sure many of you that are listening to this are actually members of the NRA. They fight for the welfare of gun owners. So. You see how generally uh, these are organizations, they're committed to a topic and they're wanting to exert influence on the government to adopt laws, adopt policy that'll be friendly to their cause. Now on top of that, I just want to be clear, it makes sense to lobby the government. Our government is democratic. That means it's reactive. It has its hand up like this. It's asking America, what do I need to be doing? And the people that can be the loudest and the best at getting in the government's ear are more likely for the government to hear their concerns. So what interest groups do is they take a bunch of people who care about a topic, they pool their resources together, and they use those resources to try to influence the government. Now, for the record, this may sound a little bit familiar. Earlier this semester, I gave you an assignment on Federalist Paper Number 10. Please summarize this very difficult Federalist Paper Number 10. Even though I have it mispresented here, I have it just the Federalist. But no, the Federalist Paper Number 10, very difficult to read. But Federalist Paper Number 10 was essentially arguing. Uh, it was responding to an anti-Federalist concern about the Constitution. That under the Constitution, there could be factions specialized groups that could get so big and powerful they could manipulate the government like a puppet. Now the argument being made in the uh, Federalist Paper number 10 was that these interest groups will exist, but we're going to allow them to exist really however they want to, so chances are there's going to be tens of thousands of these things. They're all going to fight each other, and no one interest group is going to be so powerful as to manipulate the government. Now, the truth or false of that, <laughs> the falsity or the truth of that, you can, you can kind of decipher for yourself, but nonetheless, that is the un, uh, a persuasive argument at the time that they made in Federalist Paper number 10. Which brings us back, let's do another flashback, that brings us back to our conversation from chapter one on the pluralist model of democracy. Do you remember this conversation? The pluralist model of democracy? Uh, of course, the pluralist model of democracy was a response to the outdated majoritarian model that said the government does what its proactive, informed citizens want. But the pl pluralist model is more realistic. It says we aren't proactive. We the people are not proactive. We the people are not particularly informed. 
But interest groups are. Interest groups are very proactive. They're very informed. The bigger your interest group, the more resources it's going to have to try to influence the government. And so really, our government is not a true government by the people, the way the majoritarian model describes it. It is instead a government of competing interest groups. That's what the pluralist model is asserting. And all of this is review from our conversation from chapter one. So nothing new is being presented here. So again, it makes plenty of sense to want to lobby the government. That's not necessarily a bad thing. That's an important thing. If you want the stuff you want done, it's really important that you be able to uh, to get in the government's ear. The problem some people have with interest groups is that sometimes they can get so big and so powerful, it does seem like they can manipulate politicians to however they want. Former President Trump talks about this a little bit back when he was campaigning for president. He talks in this video, well actually I'll let him speak for himself. And just remember, and it's very important, all of this money that I was talking about a little while ago, all of that money comes from my friends, guys that I know. I used to be one of them. I know the system better than anybody. All of that money that's going to Hillary and Jeb and Scott and Marco and all of them, the people that are putting up that money are, it's like puppets. Bing, bing. You saw that. They had it on Jimmy Fallon. I better not do it anymore. The bing, bing, bang, bang, boom. I was imitating puppets, and I said, maybe I shouldn't do that anymore. But it's true. They're totally controlled, totally controlled by special interests, lobbyists, and donors. Now, I don't know, uh, you know, the, the argument that tr President Trump is making here, and again, he was just then candidate Trump when he was making these arguments, but um, the argument he's making is that these really rich people He's talking specifically about billionaires, he himself a billionaire. He said, hey, I myself used to lobby the government the way that many of these people are. These billionaires, these really rich guys can give so much money to politicians, they can essentially control them. Me, I'm so rich, I can't be bought. Now, if you, you follow the Trump administration, you know that's not the case. <laughs> the Trump administration, like all administrations, uh, followed a lot of interest groups right down the policy hole. I mean, that's kind of the way that, that politics works. Uh, but just to be clear, interest groups aren't necessarily billionaires uh, pulling all the strings. That is clearly an argument he's making here. And it's undeniable that does happen happen that billionaires can get a lot of influence because of all the money that they have. Interest groups can be you and I though. If our interest groups, if you and I donate, if enough of you and I's donate $20 to a cause we really care about, eventually that cause can get so big and so powerful it can exert influence as well. Nonetheless, let's, since we're talking about interest groups, let's break down the different types of interest groups, shall we? Do I have my clicker? I, oh, I have my clicker right here. My goodness, I'm getting violent in here. And sorry, it's so dark in here sometimes. And my clicker is black, of course, so it makes, that really ranks up the uh, degree of difficulty. Anyways, there, there are different types of interest groups. There's really two broad categories. There's economic interest groups and non-economic interest groups. We'll talk about non-economic interest groups eventually. Economic groups clearly are going to be things that deal with economics, deal with money specifically. Um, now. Probably the biggest and most powerful tend to be business groups. And as the name implies, these are interest groups uh, that lobby on behalf of businesses and business owners. They try to make the laws friendlier for business and business owners. For the record, your city probably has a chamber of commerce. And the chamber, you ever wonder what the chamber of commerce is? It sounds official, sounds good, and uh, perhaps it is good from your perspective, but it is an interest group lobbying on behalf of businesses. Okay, it wants to make operating a business as manageable and as profitable as possible. This is a good thing. It's a good thing. You can go overboard with it. You can go overboard with everything. But it's a good thing to have businesses as efficiently operatable as possible, right? And as profitable as possible. Businesses hire us. Most of us work for a business. So now we want businesses to operate as functionally as possible. Now, on top of that, there's also labor unions, also known as unions. I'll just be calling them unions. But these organizations try to make lawmakers friendlier to the workers of some of these organizations, some of these companies. Okay, so business groups represent 
the uh, business owners and the businesses themselves, labor unions for companies that have them, unions try to make law try to make the laws friendlier to the interest of the workers. That's good too. Like we want you clearly unions can go overboard just like business groups can go overboard, but this is good. We want to make sure that business that workers are taken care of. Matter way, by the way, unions are responsible for the 40-hour work week. They're responsible for uh, essentially having weekends, having overtime pay, having things like paid leave for some industries. So ultimately, we are thankful for the work that unions have done for our society. Although, that, again, that's not to put a halo over them or to put a halo over business groups. Devil horns and angel halos don't belong over either of these groups. But they both do a lot of good and some bad for society. Now, for the record, for the record, uh, clearly these two entities are going to fight, right? They're going to fight a lot. Um, they're going to... Uh, they're going to, obviously, the thing, uh, we want to be paid more. Well, we don't want to pay you that much. Well, you, we want these benefits. Well, we don't necessarily want to give you these benefits. And they have to haggle with one another over the course of society over how policy should be. Now, labor unions in particular have been uh, losing some ground against business groups. They used to have a quarter of Americans back in the 70s were working in unions. Um, now it's close to 12%, so it's about half that now. It's about an eighth of Americans. So unions have seen their popularity decline over the last 50 years or so. We'll see where the future takes them. Now, they fight over a lot of things. We have talked about that already a little bit. But probably the number one thing they're fighting about these days are what we call right-to-work laws. <clears throat> right-to-work laws. Right-to-work laws. So let's take a moment to explain what exactly right to work laws are. Because I got to be honest with you, I hate the term right to work law because you have a right to work whether you're in a union or not. So I don't know why they're called that. But anyways, right to work laws technically prohibit union membership as a condition of employment. That is your textbook definition of what right to work laws are. But what a right to work law says is, if you pass a right to work law, that means unions can't force you to join. Unions can't force you to join. That's what a work right to work law is. Unions can't force you to join. Um, now, in certain industries, if you don't have right to work laws, unions can force you to join. We should know that. We live in Missouri. Right down the street from OTC is a gigantic steel factory. If you, I think it's the Mueller factory, but regardless, when you work at the steel factory, you will sign a thing saying, all right, I have a job now. Hooray, I got hired. And then you have to go into the next room where there's a union rep. And the union rep says, congratulations on your job. Now sign here. You're going to be in the union. Otherwise, you can't work this job. The union's going to charge you a fee. Uh, and that fee will go to the union for them to exert in lobbying the government and the business that you work for to accept certain benefits and pay rates and such for workers to try to influence the government and influence the market, influence the company. So right to work laws do prohibit union membership as a condition of employment. If you pass a right to work law, that means unions can't do that anymore. Now when you knock, walk into the next room, there's a union rep that says, we would like you to join the union. Here's all the benefits of joining the union. Please join the union. Um, but of course, Americans don't like being forced to do anything. We like choice. And as a result, business has been winning this battle. We don't like to walk into a room and being told that we have to join anything, even if it's a union that's fighting for us. Generally speaking, Americans like choice. Which is fine as far as it goes, but you have to understand that creates problems that weaken unions, and therefore weaken their power to fight for workers. We call this the free rider problem. If there's no mandated union sign up, then people can choose, and a certain percentage will choose, not to join the union. Causing a free rider problem. Here's the problem with unions. Uh, not the problem with unions, but here's a unique situation with unions. When unions fight for pay raises, and let's say they earn a pay raise, everybody gets it, whether you're in the union or not. So you can do the calculation in your head now, can't you? So wait a minute, I can join the union, pay a due out of my pocket, 
and maybe get a pay raise, or I cannot join the union, keep my money that would be going to the dues, and I still get the pay raise if you guys earn one, if you guys fight for one and get it, uh, I think I'll keep my money. Like a number of people will keep their money. That's called the free rider problem. And that weakens the unions because if fewer people are joining the unions, fewer people are joining the unions, that will rob the unions of members and financial influence. And that will make them less, in, less effective. If unions become less effective, fewer people in the future will want to join them, which will only make them less effective, meaning even fewer people want to join them in the future, making them even less effective in the future. So you can see how this creates a little bit of a whirlpool for unions, and that's a matter of fact what they're going through right now. Uh, several states, many states, dozens of states have adopted right-to-work laws, but dozens of states have resisted right-to-work laws. Do you know what Missouri's done? Well, Missouri's flipped and flopped on this. Back in 2016, Missouri passed a right-to-work law here in Missouri, and then in 2018, we repealed it. So Missouri right now is on the front lines in this battle over right-to-work laws here in this state. All right, so we're talking about economic interest groups. We've talked about um, business groups. We've talked about unions. Let's talk about professional organizations or professional associations. Professional associations represent an entire profession. Okay, so this will be things like the uh, ADA. Sorry, there you go. Oh, sorry, the a ADA is American Dental Association. AMA is the American Medical Association, the ABA, American Bar Association. This wants to adopt policies in the government, uh, national, state, and local, that will be friendly to doctors, friendly to lawyers. For the record, the guy you're looking at right now, me, I am the chair-elect for the faculty advisory group for the Missouri Community College Association. That is an interest group. I am a member of an interest group the MCCA, as you could probably guess from the name, lobbies the Missouri government for community college friendly policies. Uh, that's the reason why A plus exists. The MCCA fought for that. Every now and then the MCCA goes to Jeff City and says, please, please don't cut our funding, please. Mixed results. So you get the idea. Now, of course, the whole problem with economic interest groups that we have already read about, remember in the reading guide, I told you to read that section on the unorganized poor? Well, the problem with interest groups is that part of the reason they're influential, we'll talk about this here in a little bit, is because of funding. And that means the wealthy can really super, who already get pretty friendly policy, can supercharge how friendly policy is to them because they do have the ability to give the government a lot of money. Now, poor people like this guy, they may be in hard times, but there's not really, I mean, they're the interest group fighting for these guys, and there are interest groups fighting for people that are what we'll call home insecure. Fighting for these are not well funded. This guy is not donating, I'm assuming it's a guy, this guy is not donating a ton of money to an interest group. So interest groups do create an inherently unequal playing field. That's not a playing field that can, that can't be overcome. You can overcome that unequal playing field, but nonetheless, it does exist. All right, we have talked about economic interest groups. Let's take a moment to talk about non-economic interest groups. These are, of course, interest groups that care about other things other than exactly where the money is always going. Uh, for instance, there are environmental groups, uh, which you would probably already guess the definition of an environmental interest group before I even gave you the name. Obviously, they, they focus on working on influencing the government, uh, such as really big ones. You don't need to know this example of the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club is maybe the largest environmental interest group in America the Sierra Club. Now, environmental interest groups are really important these days because some of the biggest, most drastic issues we face deal with the environment, climate change for starters. But environmental groups have a challenge. And the challenge isn't that they are weak. Environmental groups can be very powerful. The problem is, is who their political opponents are. Political opponents tend to be business groups because environmental groups want, usually they want 
stronger regulations to crack down on pollution. Uh, and businesses no likey. Businesses like to be able to operate their business however they want with as few regulations as possible. So business groups are already fighting them. But you know who else is fighting environmental groups? People don't talk about this enough, but unions fight environmental groups too. Some unions often feel like environmental excessive environmental regulations can cost their, their workers jobs. So really, environmental interest groups end up in a vice a little bit. On one side, you have unions cranking in on you. On the other side, you have businesses. You have the business owners and the business workers cracking down on you. I mean, hey, you have science on your side, and that's not nothing. Science doesn't always pay the bills now, does it? <laughs> okay. Now, on top of that, there are also racial and ethnic minority groups. These, as you can guess, fight for a particular race or a particular ethnic minority. Um, you don't need to know these examples, but if they help you, like the NAACP fights for African Americans, LULAC fights for Latin Americans, AIM fights for American Indians. It, really, one of the things you will learn over time is if there is a point of view in America, or if there is a demographic in America, there is an interest group fighting for them. Some of them are really big, like NAACP, and very well known and very powerful. Others, like, uh, the, like AIM, might not be as big and might not be as well known or influential. In addition to that, there's also religious groups. Uh, are you a uh, Catholic? There's the uh, Catholic League, the Catholic Advocate. Uh, are you Jewish? There are different various Jewish groups like Jewish Women International. There's the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Maybe you think there's too much religion in our public life anyways. Well, if you are not religious, you could always consider joining several uh, uh, atheist or agnostic groups, such as the Secular Coalition for America. Again, you don't need to know these examples. You just need to know the categories, right? But they're pretty self-explanatory, I feel. There are public interest groups. These are interest groups that uh, are fighting for you know, certain sectors of society that feel like they could use the leg up. Uh, really like the Center for Livable Communities to kind of make housing more affordable. Uh, once again, uh, housing. Lots of different housing public interest groups. Habitat for Humanity, once again, housing. Uh, National Coalition for the Homeless. There's lots of these interest groups that are fighting on behalf of uh, uh, youth build of uh, certain disadvantaged groups. Public interest groups don't necessarily have to be for disadvantaged parts of society. Um, they often are. They often are. There are also ideological groups. Ideological groups largely fight for uh, in, they largely fight for a political cause that tends to be very partisan, tends to be very pro-democratic or pro-republican. For instance, there's a, a pro-democratic interest group called Americans for Democratic Action or uh, adaction.org. I'll show you their website in just a second. And there's also Americans for Tax Reform, atr.org. Uh, Democratic Action is fighting largely for liberal causes that favor Democrats. Uh, Americans for Tax Reform largely fight for uh, lower taxes is what they're committed to, but obviously fight really hard for uh, uh, Republicans and conservative causes. Here's kind of what that looks like. You're looking at the website right now. Let me blow it up just a little bit for Americans for Democratic Action. You could scroll down and learn about all the different things that they care about, like um, um, uh, corporate minimum tax proposal. Obviously, this is something that Democrats will like a little bit better. Uh, they'll talk about uh, preventing the most profitable corporations from paying nothing. Um, this is not really the most accessible website. You can learn all about the like different resisting Trump and institutional racism, health care for all. Uh, obviously, these are things that are very popular and very important to a lot of progressives in America. Here at Americans for Tax Reform, let me blow this up just a little bit. You see, uh, you know, we they, they oppose taxing, uh, so they talk about uh, how many people oppose taxing like they do. Uh, Democrat minimum tax. You just talked about. You just heard the uh, a, uh, uh, Americans for Democratic Action favoring that in, on the other website. This one they're talking about opposing it. The 15% minimum taxes will harm workers and uh, disallow bipartisan tax deductions. Blah blah blah. Uh, anti vape activists. Republicans are not responsible for rushing through. So you get the idea. It, this is tends to be very. Uh, uh, we, this tends to be very pro-conservative type website focusing on issues that are really important to a lot of conservatives. 
All right, give me one second here to catch up with where we are. So, talking about different non-economic, uh, sorry, non-economic interest groups. Uh, you know who else lobbies America that you might not see coming? Uh, foreign interest groups. Yes, foreign countries end up lobbying America a lot. Here is a list of the top, whatever this is, top 10, top 12, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is like the top 12 countries for the last few years in lobbying America. Some of these you'd suspect, like Japan is like one of our top trade partners. You'd expect Japan to lobby America a lot. You'd expect that from Saudi Arabia and China and South Korea. Um, you know, big time economic partners of ours. Uh, but a lot of other countries might come as a surprise, like Liberia or Bahamas or Ireland. Ireland spends more in lobbying America than almost every other country on earth. So it's kind of, it's kind of a surprising list. But yeah, foreign groups can lobby American politicians. They're not representing Americans in any way. They're representing the interests of their country. But nonetheless, they're allowed to do that here in America. So we're aware of this at this point. We're aware of this at this point. Let me make sure I'm recording. Okay, everything looks like I'm recording properly. I hope this is going okay. Anyways, we know that they lobby. We know that these different groups may lobby. Can we talk about the different ways that they lobby? The different ways that these different organizations lobby. First of all, there are direct techniques. And direct techniques, as the name implies, is when an interest group, that's what IG is supposed to mean there, that's when an interest group uses direct interaction, direct interaction. There's no middleman. I'm not reaching out to somebody who's then reaching out to the government. Me, the interest group, I'm reaching out. My pros are reaching out to the government directly to further our group's goals. So this can be anything from donating money. If I donate to your campaign, that's a direct interaction. Uh, also, I can meet with you personally. I can literally sit in your office. I may give you an assignment uh, about, uh, I interviewed a lobbyist for the American Lung Association. They advocate for lung health, particularly in combating things that create cancer and such. But I can always, uh, the guy I interviewed has met with many lawmakers personally. It's very common for these larger interest groups to do. Sometimes interest groups will testify in front of committees in front of Congress. Because after all, if I'm going to pass like a gun control law, who better to talk to than the NRA? The NRA tend to be gun experts. They, um, they will probably not like whatever gun control issues I come up with. But nonetheless, their perspective would be valuable. Let's bring them in and hear from them. Uh, they can... By the way, interest groups can straight up write laws. They can straight up write laws. Uh, we saw this in action during the uh, Trump tax cut. There was a massive Trump, uh, tax cut passed by the Trump administration in 2000, I want to say 19, 2017, somewhere in there. But regardless, this is a law that was entirely written by interest groups, conservative interest groups. Again, that's not necessarily bad. Most of our laws start out uh, as written by interest groups, so that's very common. Matter of fact, my interest group, if I really like a particular politician, I can straight up run ads for them. So all of these are where I'm directly impacting. I'm directly communicating and working with a politician that I am lobbying. Now obviously the opposite of a direct technique would be an indirect technique. This is when an interest group, instead of making direct contact, uses a third party. Using a third party to influence government officials for me. So the third party is usually going to be some version of the public. I'm trying to get the public to apply pressure. I want you to adopt a policy. I can lobby you in person, and I probably will. Uh, I'll do the best I can anyways. But regardless of whether I'm communicating with you in person, one thing I can do is reach out to the people, try to convince them that this is a bad idea or a good idea, and have them apply pressure on you for me. If I'm smart, I'm doing both. I'm meeting with you personally, and I'm having a third party, such as the public, generate pressure on you. If the public pressures you, so instead of my pros that I personally hire as an interest group, I can have 
grassroots lobbying, whereas I'm trying to get the public to care about it so much, they influence you for me. Many interest groups will, if you are, are you a member of an interest group, maybe you get emails from them on a regular basis, they may tell you, hey, Congress is working on this law and it cannot stand. Here's a pre-written letter that we've given you. Just sign your name at the bottom and send it in to Congress so they know you care about such and such issue. That's called grassroots lobbying. Now, on top of that, that's a letter writing campaign. Now on top of that, they can organize protests or boycotts. What's the whole point of a protest or a boycott though? Is to make the public aware of an issue that you care about and generating public pressure. So again, they, they'll conduct studies. You get the idea. What The main thing we're trying to do here is get the rank and file members, trying to get the general public to apply pressure on behalf of the interest group. And if the interest group's worth their salt, they're doing that while trying to apply direct pressure. Now, interest groups, there are thousands of them. There are thousands of them out there. I think uh, there's uh, there was some ridiculous study I saw. I'm not going to quote it right, but 6,000 uh, lobbyists for every person who works in Congress is what I was hearing. But not all interest groups are created equal, now are they? So let's ask this question. What is it that makes an interest group powerful? What is it that makes an interest group powerful? Well, there are lots of different factors that make some interest groups powerful and some interest groups not so powerful. But probably the most important thing uh, when it comes to how powerful an interest group is, is membership size. Membership size is really important when it comes to how powerful an interest group is. Now, money is another factor. There he goes, how much money your interest group has. And there's one other thing as well. But nonetheless, what's the most important thing when it comes to making an interest group influential? It's membership size. Because while money is influential, money is not gonna vote you out of office, people are gonna vote you out of office. Stand by one second. Hey guys, rejoining you. Sorry about that, there's a little difficulty in the room, but nonetheless, Let's, let's continue our conversation. We're talking about why some interest groups are powerful. The number one reason why interest groups are powerful is because of membership size. Again, you might be guessing money. There are other factors. But the number one reason why the AARP is so effective is because once you turn 65, once you turn really like 55, you start getting mail from them. And a huge percentage of, a, of, of the elderly in America belong to the AARP. That's why you don't mess with the AARP. ARP. You don't mess with Social Security, you don't mess with Medicare, don't mess with things that the elderly take advantage of because, first of all, in many cases they need that stuff, but second of all, politically they will punish you because nobody votes like the elderly. Don't screw with them politically. They are the third rail in American politics and you will pay the price. And membership is important because unlike money, people actually do vote you out of office. Now money plays a role but it's votes that kick you out. So obviously if there's a gigantic interest group with millions of members and they sit in your office and they say, do this, don't do that, or else we're gonna have all our members vote against you, um, you know, all, you'll pay a good amount of attention to them, right? Now on top of that, how proactive is your membership? This is why groups like, N, uh, a, like the NRA are so effective. The NRA membership is fantastic at reaching out to elected officials on behalf of the NRA, saying we care about this issue, this issue, we don't like that issue, we like this issue, please vote this way, don't vote that way. The NRA is extremely good at uh, getting its members to act. So is PETA for that matter. PETA not as large as NRA, not as well funded as the NRA, but uh, PETA is really good at getting public attention for their cause because their membership tends to be very proactive. We talked about money before. Money does not kick you out of office, but it pays for advertising and it pays people who work for you. It pays the politicians themselves in underhanded, slightly less than ethical ways. So money can be uh, money can be an important role, and uh, you want your leadership to be effective. Matter of fact, there is a problem in America called the revolving door for lobbyists. Many people that work in the government, when they leave the government, they will go work for a lobbying group. The lobbying group will hire them because their time working in the government 
curated relationships and that will make them a very good lobbyist for the for their former co-workers so how effective is your leadership there's obviously many there's many different ways that interest groups can be powerful and not so powerful So obviously, if these interest groups are pretty good at getting the government to listen to what they have to say, what reforms have we enacted to kind of neuter their power a little bit so they don't overwhelm our democracy? Well, there haven't been a ton. Really, interest groups have been increasingly deregulated. We've, get, we've taken the ropes off more and more and more when it comes to interest groups. And that's because if you pass a law tomorrow saying all interest groups have to be restricted in this way or that way, who's going to fight that? All interest groups, right? So it's really hard to get reforms of interest groups passed. Um, the few regulations we've put in place largely deal with transparency. Like, for instance, we have this thing called the Lobbying Disclosure Act. This forces you, before you lobby the government, to register as a lobbyist. So before you can go off and influence your local legislator, hold on, says America, you have to register as a lobbyist. Lobbyist? And what does the lobbyist do? The lobbyist says, okay, I'm a lobbyist, and off they go. It doesn't really affect their job any. The whole point of that is to shame politicians from meeting with certain lobbyists, because it might make them look bad, but it has not super effect. That's about it, though. As far as regulating lobbyists has gone, We've really just enforced transparency. We haven't really bound them in any particular serious way. Um, at the end of the day, there are some limits on how much money you can spend, but most of those are flimsy. You can get around them pretty easily. So guys, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sugarcoat it here. It gets real, especially we talk about this in this chapter in this. <laughs> In this class, sometimes you may not feel amazing about democracy, particularly in this first part of the chapter. Uh, you think, wow, this is, is, do we even have a democracy? Like you, you feel really, really bad and really doom and gloom about democracy after learning about interest groups. But guys, let me soothe your savage nerves for a minute by letting you know that interest groups aren't bad. They're not bad things. Okay, they're not. They're not really good either, though. <laughs> they're not really good either. What they are is they're tools. They are tools like a shovel. Shovels aren't good. Shovels aren't bad. It's all about how you use it. You can use it in a good way. You can use it in a bad way, right? So uh, that's what interest groups are. Matter of fact, think of a law you like that you've seen passed in the last 10 years. Have there been any that you've <laughs> paid attention to that you've seen? Any law that you've liked that's been passed in the past 10 years interest groups are responsible for them. Interest groups push for just about every single law. And so that does mean that if you like a law, an interest group was responsible. Many people were responsible, but an interest group played a part. Okay. Of course, that means that all the laws we don't like <laughs> were also pushed by interest groups. So needless to say, they play a huge role, positive and negative. Okay. But at the end of the day, we do have to listen to Federalist Paper number 10. We can't particularly ban them, nor should we, is the argument that Madison makes. Now, in the First Amendment, we are guaranteed a right to assemble. We'll learn about this more in Chapter 4 if we haven't already. I believe we already have. But I, I forget sometimes the order because they're a little bit different for online than they are in person. But nonetheless, the First Amendment guarantees a right to assemble. Now, that means we can organize freely and get our interests represented in Congress. That's a constitutional right we have. Interest groups are a constitutional right. And that doesn't mean that they're good, doesn't mean that they're bad, it's all about how you use them. It's all about how you use them. Guys, that is the first half of chapter seven. Let's move on to the second half, this time hopefully with no technical difficulties in the room. I hope, I hope. That's the case. <laughs> now we talk about political parties. This is kind of the two major parties that run America. Here's a bunch of third parties. Let's talk about these guys before long. But first of all, let's start at the ground floor. What are political parties? What are they? 
Well, you kind of see, I'm not a huge fan of the fact that political parties get grouped in with interest groups here. I think they each deserve their own chapter. But you kind of see why the textbook grouped them up when you see the textbook definition. Political parties are a group of political activists who organize to determine public policy. They're a group of political activists who organize to determine public policy. That is the textbook definition. Now that sounds a little bit like interest groups now, doesn't it? I mean, what are interest groups? Well, they are also groups of political activists. They organize to influence public policy, not determine. So that's, what, that's the difference there. But let's make that difference clear, OK? Because some people might read that definition and say, oh, so they're basically interest groups then. Well, no. There is a major difference between the two. The major difference between political parties and interest groups is that political parties actually put up candidates to win elections. The next time you vote, you're going to be voting between a Democrat, a Republican, and other people. There's not going to be like an NRA candidate. There's not going to be an AARP candidate. Okay, political parties actively put up people to win elections. They put them up, they help them win, and when they win, they help them govern. That's why what just about every person we have who's elected to run government in America belongs to a political party. And every time you see them on the news, like our senator, one of our two senators, Josh Hawley, whenever you see him on the news or read him in an article, you'll see an R. Mo next to his name. Mo obviously means Missouri. But the R right here, that means he is a Republican. That is essentially a NASCAR patch. Boom, like a NASCAR patch. Like NASCAR drivers have to wear jumpsuits that tell you who sponsors them. The R is the sponsor, okay? The Republican Party sponsors Josh Hawley. That means the, the news is warning you he's a Republican, he's gonna say a bunch of Republican things. Okay, same thing when you see a D for Democrat or a D Mo for a Democrat from Missouri. They're gonna say a bunch of Missouri things and a bunch of Republican things. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, as a result, Hawley is going to be mostly agree with the Republican Party on just about everything. And if he doesn't agree with the Republican Party, they may drop him like a bad habit and sponsor somebody else. Now, uh, for the record, again, let, I hope that makes it clear, the difference between political parties and interest groups. I hope that makes it clear. But in the off chance it doesn't make it clear, let me simplify it as much as possible. Okay, This is the most simplified thing I can think to put it. Political parties are trying to run the government from the inside. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to run the government from the inside. Okay. Interest groups are trying to influence the government from the outside. So that's the key difference between the two. That's the key difference between the two. Now, you might be hearing about this and saying, okay, well, clearly political parties are a force to be reckoned with. That means if you want to get elected, you have to be in a political party, right? If you have to be, in, if you want to run for office, you have to be in a political party. Well, not necessarily. You can be what we call an independent. And an independent is somebody, as the name implies, who runs independent of any political party. They're not being sponsored by a political party. Instead, they're just running under their own name. Now, in a way, that's great. Because I don't have to be the mouthpiece for a political party anymore. And you know what? No one political party matches up with my specific belief system. So may be the case. And that means that I can let my freak flag fly. And I can voice my own opinions however I see fit, not owned by any particular political party. I can do that. And that's great. Probably feels good. And you're going to need it to feel good because you're probably going to lose. You're probably going to lose. Political parties just offer too many advantages for their chosen candidates. There are too many advantages for their preferred candidates. One of those advantages, very important, is that you have the brand name. When I run as a Republican or when I run as a Democrat, you probably don't know who I am. Most studies say most voters, other than the presidential candidates, don't really know who they're voting for. You don't know anything about me, but if you see the R next to my name, like if you ever go vote, you'll see like, you know, 
Actually, here's what it'll look like if you ever go vote. Here's what it looks like if you ever go vote. Next time you go vote, you'll see like there's a candidate named uh, Andrew Crocker, and then uh, on the in the other column it'll say like Republican, right? And then there'll be another one, maybe you know uh, uh, another candidate named French. He'll be your Democrat. Now, you don't know anything about Crocker, the candidate. You don't know anything about him unless you've interviewed me or gone to my website or done a lot of research. Very few Americans have done that. So you don't know much about me. But if you see the rep next to my name, oh, all of a sudden, while you don't know who I am, you do know the Republican Party. You do know who the Republican Party is. And as a result, you can probably guess that I'm, I'm probably generally conservative and I agree with the Republican Party 90% of the time. Okay. Now, the same thing, if you don't know anything about French, you know he's a Democrat, you know he's going to be progressive. Uh, or if you read about somebody who's like Felix and they're independent, you know, say independent. But if they're running independent, what do you know about the Felix candidate? You might not know anything about her. You probably don't know anything about her. And you don't have a brand name to fall back on. I mean, an independent could very well be a Nazi. Okay, Most people who run for as an independent are not Nazis, I'm guessing. But uh, they, they got to be out there. If they are out there, they could very well be independent. So you, know, you, ne you have no idea what this is. And so as a result, you're very rarely to vote for independents unless you specifically know them and specifically know who they are. Other advantages that political parties offer you. Money. Political parties have far better funding than independents do. They have had financial pipelines built in over decades. We know exactly who likes to donate money. We know exactly how much they like to donate. We have found all the rich people. We know where they all live and all, all of the ones who support us. Uh, on top of that, uh, they have superior connections with the media. If I'm with the newsletter, I know exactly what office to call if I need a comment from a Republican lawmaker on such and such issue. But independents are notoriously difficult to get a hold of. I should know that. I constantly try to get a hold of local politicians for various OTC related events and some of them if they're independent are really hard to get a hold of you have to either find their social media page half the time their social media page doesn't have contact information now on top of that another advantage is that they will some they oftentimes these political parties will hire people to help you win professionals campaign advisors campaign uh, directors to run your campaign for you Okay. Now, with that in mind, for independents to do well, you're, you're, you're outgunned. You're, you're primarily outgunned. We have 535 people in Congress, uh, 534 of them, I believe, no, 535, 533 of them belong to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. There's really only two independents and they caucus with the Democrats. So, so actually there's three independents. There's one in the House that I forgot. He, I think he caucuses with nobody. I don't even think he caucuses with the Republicans. He's a former Republican. Anyways, so with that in mind, you gotta have a lot of resources that you can generate for yourselves. You either gotta be rate, really good at fundraising or you gotta be rich or well known. If you're gonna be an independent, that's really your only screaming shot here, okay? All right, this is normally where I'd take a moment to talk about like Bernie Sanders, but I just did. He's one of the independents in Congress. He is traditionally an independent, but he does all of his work with the Democrats. He caucuses with the Democrats. So when he runs for president, which he's done a couple times, he runs within the Democratic primary. So, you know, uh, he's in an uneasy alliance with the Democratic Party, and that's because he understands as an independent, I can't accomplish anything unless I'm doing teamwork with the political party. All right, so that kind of brings us to kind of the brass tacks here. What is it exactly that political parties do in America? Well, clearly what they do is they recruit candidates for local office. I'm looking for a candidate to run for, you know, local dog catcher. Hey, I think you'd be a great dog catcher. Please run for this office. Uh, now, of course, if you agree, I'll organize and run your campaign. And uh, uh, one of the things we'll do as a result is present a bunch of policy alternatives. You might not have views on a lot of political issues, but the party does, and they'll ask that you adopt almost all of them. 
and that's called a party platform. That's a set of issues. You can look up the Democratic Party platform, uh, which is very extensive. The Republican Party platform, for one reason or another, is very short, very vague. I don't know why that is. Maybe they don't want to be on record or something. I don't know. But regardless, you can look up a party's platform and how they feel on things. And you can be rest assured that most Democrats will agree with almost everything on the Democratic platform. Same thing with the Republican Party. Now, if you are successful and you win your office, the political party doesn't go away. They help you. They help you find people to hire. They help you operate the governments. They help you get. They help you with uh, resources and polling. And uh, but of course, if you don't win, you lose. That's what we call uh, divided. Well, not divided government. But if you lose, that means that the party that supported you is essentially out of power, and they'll operate operate as organized opposition. Now, what America typically likes. Uh, America rarely likes having one party in power of the presidency and Congress. Instead, they like divided government because they'll elect a president. Usually, they'll elect Congress that agrees with the president. That's what we have right now. We have, we have Biden. We have Democratic majorities in the House and barely a majority in the Senate. Um, now, for the record, the American public is probably going to vote those majorities out. They'll keep Biden around for a little bit longer, but they'll vote those majorities out in 2022. And if that's the case, you're going to have divided government, or part of the government, uh, in this case Congress, is controlled by one party, and another part of the government, in this case the presidency, is controlled by another party. For one reason or another, uh, Americans really generally prefer this approach. Now, I talk about political parties. I really just talk about two. No, don't I. I really just talk about the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And that's because America has a two-party system. Now, two-party system doesn't mean that there's only two political parties in America. There's actually dozens of political parties in America. But you really only have two that have any reasonable chance of winning. Here's the two. You probably already know them. But in the off chance you aren't immediately familiar with these two organizations, there you go. America really only has two, chan uh, two parties that have a reasonable chance of winning. The Democratic Party, which tends to be more liberal or progressive, and the Republican Party, which tends to be more conservative. Guys, why is that the case? Does that have to be the case? Does that have to be the case? Every single time we ask the American people, hey, would you like more options to vote for? The American people say yes. This is just the latest in a long line of polls that Americans are saying, we need a viable third party. Give us more choices. We're Americans after all. Give us choices, give us choices, give us choices. And I hear this all the time every given election. I heard this a lot back in 2016. You know, America's ready. A, a third party is going to emerge and it's really going to show these other two major parties. Guys, that's, that's probably not going to happen. Definitely not going to happen in my lifetime. Probably not going to happen in yours. But why? Who do we blame for that? Who do we blame for having a two-party system? Do we blame these two political parties for running the government and then passing laws making it harder for third parties to succeed? You can. Do you want to blame third parties for having bad messages or being ineffective promoters of their own messages? You can. Do we want to blame the American public themselves? The American public who, if they wanted to, could pass a law tomorrow saying, um, uh, not pass a law, let me just say that again. Do we want to blame American citizens who, if they wanted to, could elect a bunch of people from third parties in the very next election, but they're not going to do that? I mean, who do you blame for this? You can blame all three of those parties, and they all deserve a fair amount of blame. But the primary blame rests with the people who wrote the Constitution, people we will call the Founding Fathers. The people who wrote the Constitution are primarily responsible for the two-party system. And that's because the Founding Fathers created our current election system. And our current election system is a winner-take-all system. It has sometimes been called first-past-the-post. That's fine, but this is too complicated. Instead, our current election system is called winner-take-all. Winner-take-all. Now, you know what that means. That means if you win an election, you get all of the power. It doesn't matter if you win 60% to 40%. It doesn't matter if you win 
35% to 25%. <laughs> Everybody else uh, voted for you know some amalgam of other candidates, and you only got 35%, but you got more votes than everybody else. You get 100% of the power. That's the winner-take-all system. Where the and, and uh, that means the winner gets everything, but more importantly, the loser gets nothing. And I say more importantly because studies confirm Americans want political power. But more than they want political power, they are terrified of having no political power. And so as a result, voters tend to vote strategically. Let's explain. I'm going to be, I think the best way for me to do that is to be off screen, <laughs> maybe. But it's for voters to vote strategically. Here's how it works. Here's our political spectrum. You have extreme liberalism on one side, extreme conservatism on the other side, and you know these are more moderate positions in the middle. Now, of course, we have two major political parties in America, DNP, you've seen that before in the previous chapter, that's the Democratic Party, and then you have the GOP, which is the Republican Party. Uh, we've talked about them a little bit in the previous chapter. They are more conservative, the Democratic Party is more liberal. Now, these are not your only political options. Maybe the Liberal Party is not liberal enough, if that's the case. There's the Green Party, which is downright socialist. You can go that far if you want. Uh, is the Republican Party not conservative enough for you? You can go downright libertarian with the nicely named Libertarian Party. It tells you exactly what they believe, right? So anyways, these are the four most popular parties in America, even though the top, those middle two parties are heads and shoulders more popular than the others. Now, before we get going much further here, let's take a moment to talk about the American public. The American public generally votes in thirds across America. About one-third of America votes more progressive, one-third of America votes more conservative, and another third is kind of the other, meaning they're voting somewhere in the middle. Oh, that's not, that was a typo there. Uh, but nonetheless, they vote somewhere in the middle. We call them independent voters. They tend to flip and flop from one election to another. We tend to call them swing voters. They swing from one way to another in any given election. And the way America tends to vote is that that liberal third of voters will rally around the Democratic Party, giving them a liberal base of 33%, roughly 30% support. It doesn't matter how unpopular Biden ever gets, he will always have at least 30% support. That will never abandon him. Same thing with Trump. It doesn't matter how unpopular Trump gets. And Biden's pretty unpopular now, but Trump was really unpopular at one point. He will never dip below 30% approval. That's a conservative base. It will never go away from him. Now the goal here is for both parties to begin with their base of roughly one third of America and then wrestle for these voters in the middle. Whoever wins the most of these voters in the middle almost always ends up winning you know, national politics, winning the presidency. That's the way it works. But does it have to be that way? Does it have to be that way? What's stopping like a huge portion of the conservative third saying, we've had it up to here with the Republican Party and sprouting off to the Libertarian Party. Let's say a good 15% of Americans, give or take, end up abandoning the Republican Party and voting for the Libertarian Party. This could happen in any given election, but it's not going to. Do you know why? Well, the reason why is because if 15% of America ended up supporting the Libertarian Party, that 15% has to come from somewhere, and it's probably coming from the conservative base. Now, the Republican Party is operating with a base of 18 to 20%, and is at a huge disadvantage to the Democratic Party that has retained, we'll say, its base of 30%. So the Democratic Party has to win far fewer of these votes in the middle than the Republican Party does to win. You see, this is what we call splitting the base. If you split the base, if you leave your designated party that you like for the party you love, you're really only helping the party you hate the most, and both of these parties are now out of power. That's why sometimes third parties are called spoilers. Sometimes they're called spoiler parties. Uh, and uh, third parties, as you would guess, 
really don't like that description. What you're about to see here is Gary Johnson, a third party candidate in 2016. He's running for the Libertarian Party. And at 446, look what happens when he's asked about being a spoiler. Okay, so not all at once. Stand by. It's horrible. Why would you even say that? We're giving people a chance to vote for something as opposed to the lesser of two evils. That's what we are, that's what we are providing. First vote. You want to waste your vote with Hillary or Clint uh, or or Trump? Go right ahead and waste your vote. We're not spoilers. We are the first vote. Last question. So you get the idea here. So I guess we should. But oh, hold on. Look, he's he he has more to say. <laughs> drop out. Is that what you're saying? Is that is that your editorial here? Is that we should drop out? All right. So uh, clearly, you know, he's really upset. Uh, and you can hardly blame him, right? You can hardly blame him. He's, the American people say, give us more choices. He's giving us an additional choice by running, and yet he's fielding these questions about, like, really, are if you get more popular, aren't you just ruining the Republicans' chance of winning? Um, so you can see how people feel. I completely sympathize with Gary Johnson there. But the math is the math, and there's not a whole lot he can do to get around that. Now, you can change your winner-take-all system to something else, perhaps the proportional system. Let's talk about that here in a minute. But the winner-take-all system is written into the Constitution. So yeah, are you looking to blame somebody? That's fine, but blame the Founding Fathers. They wrote the Constitution, and if you want to fix that system, you got to fix the Constitution. Now, maybe you don't want to do that, but if you do, one option you could consider is the proportional system. This is a si if all you care about is getting more options out there. If that's all you care about, is getting more options for voters to choose from, proportional system is a slam dunk. Now, it's got other problems that the winner-take-all system doesn't have. We'll talk about that in two seconds. But regardless, how does a proportional system work? Well, it sounds fancy, proportional system, but it's actually pretty straightforward. The percentage of the vote you get is the percentage of the power you get. The percentage of the vote you get is the percentage of the power you get. The percentage of the vote you get is the percentage of the power you get. So, in a winner-take-all system, you get 100% of the power if you win. But in a proportional system, let's say you have five different parties running for office, okay? And the most popular party tends to be Party D. Now, in a winner-take-all system, uh, you will clearly mark all these other parties out by, 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 and party D is left, and they wield 100% of the power. But in a proportional system, party D gets 42% of the seats, uh, C gets 30% of the seats, and so on. Even party E, these weirdos with only 3%, they're probably weirdos, and if they only get 3% of the vote, they still get 3% of the seats. That's not a lot. But that's better than nothing. And if you give party E the option, they'll probably take the 3% over the 0%. So again, this allows for many political parties to thrive. Uh, most, uh, most of our Western neighbors, like Canada and most of Europe, has proportional systems. Most of Europe and most in Canada has three major political parties. Some other parties, like Germany, have like 10. Israel has 20 major political parties because they have a proportional system that allows for them to have some sort of lifeline beyond the top two. Now, if this is a winner-take-all situation, could you imagine a winner-take-all situation? If it's a winner-take-all election and you see the polling and these four, five parties are running, party D is is leading with 42% of the vote. You can see how party C might freak out and say, oh my goodness, party D is going to win this thing and we're going to have no power. If that's the case, what we need to do is call up party B. Hey, party B, you and I are going to both be locked out of power. We got to combine forces and overtake party D. And maybe they do that if they're successful they'll end up with more political support than Party D. Of course, that means Party D will freak out and say, uh, oh my goodness, let's get on the phone with Party A. Uh, Party A, 
we are getting locked out of power. If uh, B and C win, we need to combine forces. And of course, if they do, that gives them 49%. This is the new AD political party going, to get, uh, going up against the CB political party. And who knows where these weirdos will end up. And so you can see how in a winner-take-all system, this really boils down to a two-party system right quick, right? Why do we have a two-party system? Because of the winner-take-all system. This is the dynamic it creates. So clearly, the proportional system is the way to go, right? Well, it has things going for itself. Like, for instance, if all you're looking for is more political options, then yeah, the proportional system's a slam dunk. However, sometimes, uh, not enough. The, the, the party that ends up winning can't form a workable coalition to govern. And if that's the case, if you can't get to 50%, if you can't, then you, you, it'll, it, you, it's really, really, really difficult to govern effectively. Because party D can't govern on their own at 42%. They need teammates. So maybe they can get part of C or all of B or some combination of A and E to work with them. And if they can't form a coalition, the government essentially collapses and they have to re, they have to rejigger a new election. This is what happened in Israel in, I believe, in uh, 2021, early this year, or late 2020. Israel went several rounds and couldn't establish a governing coalition, which means just there's no workable governing coalition for months and months and months in Israel. That's a huge problem. So winner-take-all system, you'll always have one party running everything. Uh, and so if that's the case, you don't have to deal with this risk. All right. So... Let's talk about the other parties beyond the two-party system, because here in America, we have dozens of political parties. I'm not going to talk about the political parties specifically, but I will talk about different categories of third parties. Let's do that, different categories of third parties, starting with what we call splinter groups. And splinter groups, splinter groups are anytime you have uh, a political party, a third party, splinter off of a major political party. This happens in the uh, Republican Party. They had the Tea Party split off at one point. That's not very good PowerPointing now, is it? But regardless, the Re Democratic Party uh, at one point had the DSA branch off, the Democratic Socialists of America. They didn't feel like the Democratic Party was liberal enough or socialist enough, so they left the party, created their own political party. They'll run their own candidates against Democrats if need be. Um, but uh, the Tea Party did that to the Republican Party and later got reabsorbed into the Republican Party. The DSA has not really been reabsorbed into the Democratic Party, but almost all their support has withered away and reabsorbed into the Democratic Party. So splinter groups can come. You don't need to know these examples, but if they help you, so be it. Same thing with ideological third parties. Ideological third parties tend to be a little bit more radical in their political philosophies. Now, what have we said about being radical in this class? Being radical is not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It just means you're far away from the status quo. So the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, a lot more, you know, these two parties, all ideological third parties like the Constitution Party or the DSA, the DSA is a type of ideological party. Uh, these type, these third parties will look at the Democrats or Republicans arguing with each other and they'll say things like, um, man, those two parties, they're just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. That's all they're doing. What you got to do, so say these parties, is you got to burn the mother down and rebuild from the ashes completely differently. Now, that's radical, right? Now, that might not necessarily be wrong based on your point of view, but that's a pretty radical point of view. And obviously, that's what these third parties tend to gravitate towards. There are also single issue parties, single issue parties, which really just care about a, as the name implies, a single issue. There's several of these. One of them, the most uh, well-known, because we keep talking about it in political science classes, is the Prohibition Party. The Prohibition Party wants to repeal the 21st Amendment and go right back to banning the production, manufacturing, distribution of alcohol in America. That's what they want to ban. They want to ban alcohol. They want to ban the booze. Now, the Republican, I'm sorry, the Republican, the Prohibition Party has no chance of winning, but they do run their own presidential candidates. I believe in the last election, they got 6,000 votes across all of America. Joe Biden got 80 million votes. So, that, you know, obviously these guys understand they're not really going to win. And to be honest with you, single issue parties are not really in it to win it. They're kind of in it to influence the public conversation more than anything else. Um, like, they, they understand that they're not going to win. I don't think they want to win, because, like, what if we actually elected a prohibition president? 
Okay, so be it. That's the one issue they care about. But there's a thousand things you got to care about. Like, what are we going to do about COVID? What are we going to do about COVID-19? Well, you know, the prohibition president says, ban more alcohol. You know, there's not a whole lot that they're going to do there. They're just in it to kind of affect the conversation. Uh, now, on top of that, on top of that, there's another group that I want to include here. But guys, let me put them in their own little category here. Okay, these guys go in their own category. It's not a very good line now, is it? This blue marker doesn't really get the job done. There we go. All right, putting them in their own category because, guys, independents are not third parties. We've already talked about independents in this class. They're not third parties. Independents are not political parties. I'm just putting them on this list because they do act like third parties, right? Uh, but, but unlike political parties, there's no party sponsoring you. You're just running on your own name. Now, we had a, a, a pretty prominent example of that back in 2016 with a guy named Evan McMullen. There he is right there, handsome devil that he is. I always feel like he looks like a Christian rock bassist, <laughs> right? I'm just here, to, just here to jam, just here to jam. Anyway, Evan McMullen ran for president of America in only the state of Utah. Why would he do that? Well, because Utah is really Republican, it's really conservative, but it's really Mormon. And Mormons tend to be very socially conservative. In 2016, Donald Trump runs for president. He's a Republican, okay, but he's not socially conservative, right? He, he may support socially conservative policies, he does, but he very much, I mean, he's written books about affairs he's had. So that's somebody that like Mormons might not gravitate towards. And as a result, they wanted their own conservative candidate to run so they could vote for somebody they agree with and I guess sleep at night. So Evan McMullen ran and even though he has everything going for him, he's uh, conservative, he's borderline libertarian, he's, an in, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Mormon, he has all these things going for him, he still comes in a distant third in, this, in his own state of Utah, even though that's the only state he campaigned in. So Trump wins Utah still comfortably. Hillary does what she does, but uh, as a Democrat in Utah, you're not going to do very well. But uh, Evan McMullen pulls in about a fifth of the votes. That's about the best he could have hoped for, I'm assuming. Guys, that is our conversation on Chapter 7. Uh, that covers political parties and interest groups. A really big chapter, I understand. I wasn't the one that decided to put them both into the same chapter, so forgive me for that. Um, but uh, uh, from now on, we, fr from, from here on out, we keep marching. We now march on to Chapter 8, and uh, the conversation in, chapter, in Unit 3 continues. If you have any questions, please email me, uh, and uh, I'll try to help you, out, help you out the best I can. Thank you so much.